Hello and welcome to a very special program. AI, artificial intelligence, is a buzzword. We keep talking about it, we keep reading about it. And very often the conversation, in fact most of the time, is through the prism of technology. And while that is clearly important, it's perhaps equally important, in some senses even more important, to look at AI and where we may be headed through the prism of the humanities. And that's what this discussion is meant to be. Because if we don't look at artificial intelligence through the prism of humanities, we may not actually be getting the answers that we seek. The software alone surely cannot decide where we are headed with the technology. So it's important to have a human interface. What should that human interface be? Who's winning the race? Is it the technology and algorithms within a machine? Uh, or is it, in fact, the person in the loop? Uh, these are just a couple of ideas and we've got two wonderful speakers with us today to talk about AI and its future through the prism of the humanities and then perhaps on to some other issues as well. Rishi Jaitley with us, entrepreneur, educator, he's a senior advisor to OpenAI, he's leading the charge of OpenAI in India and South Asia. He's also vice chairperson of the National Humanities Center in the United States and so uh, he's going to be putting on his hat as uh, a, hu a humanities student uh, and uh, somebody who learns from the humanities and of course we'll ensure he puts on his hat as a tech uh, guru in a sense as well. Dr. Robert Newman is president of the National Humanities Center, uh, would perhaps be the best person to address some of these uh, issues uh, related to ethics, related to the humanities. He drives a mission to get people to engage with the humanities which is so very important. Thank you very much for being with us. Rishi to you first. Why are we looking at this through the prism of the humanities and not through the prism of the tech and where it's headed with AI? Well, in many ways, well, first of all, thank you again, Vishnu. I mean, in many ways, the humanities have long been underground, at least, powering global Silicon Valley for a long time. So this has actually been a truth for a long time. Steve Jobs famously uh, declared that Apple lived on Humanities Avenue and Technology Street. Since then, the founder of AOL was a politics major, the founder of Reddit, a history major, the founders of Airbnb designers, the founder of Slack, a philosophy major, the founder of LinkedIn, a philosophy student. And so throughout Silicon Valley and global technology, in my experience as a history major, I have found the humanities to be ever present. But I think it's time we give it a name. I think it's time we give the humanities the stage they deserve. And in this AI ascendant era, I can't think of a more opportune moment to talk about this a bit more out loud. So I think that's why we're here. I think that's why, I think this moment demands it. How did you make the transition from being um, a history student to being a tech guru in a sense? And um, how have your ideas and interests in AI been influenced by your background as a history student? Sure, I mean, and I appreciate that. I mean, a lot of people ask me that question. And I think, I think history at its core is about developing retrospective vision, right? You're looking back on a particular episode in history and you're, you're making sense, signal from noise. And what is leadership in business? Leadership in business is about developing prospective vision. You're looking ahead through the density and, and making sense. And so in many ways, the skills, you know, all of us in the, in the business and tech world understand the power of storytelling, the power of story listening, the power of introspection, the power of imagination are all superpowers. Yes. And so for me, I've actually found the journey to feel, feel okay. Um, it's just that we didn't have a culture that saw it back, right? And I, and I sense that changing now. But for me, you know, I began my career as a speech writer in the technology industry uh, and, then, and then have turned that into other, other roles. But mainstreaming the identity that a humanities student can do well in technology is, I think, important, particularly in this era. Professor uh, Newman, what if we let the algorithms be and decide for themselves, if I can use the word themselves, uh, where the technology leads us? What would be problematic with that? Well, lacking the human element, I think, is extremely problematic. I would add uh, to what Rishi talked about in terms of introspection and retrospection, the idea of ex extrospection as fundamental to the humanities. That is, humanities narratives teach us to reach beyond ourselves into other things. Machine learning doesn't do that. 
machine learning is uh, interior. It's uh, entirely self-reflective. Um, and the human connection, the ability to create uh, humanly is extremely important in every facet of what we do. Um, is there also a big concern, Professor Newman, that um, our understanding of ourselves, of the world around us, uh, of what is relevant and what may not be relevant, can only be decided if there is a human input and that the algorithms themselves may be picking answers based on large data sets which may not necessarily be relevant or accurate? Well, the algorithms uh, are uh, also programmed by humans and therefore the algorithms have certain biases that are programmed into them by, by humans as well. So our own um, gender biases, racial biases, etc are uh, infected into uh, these various algorithms. It's really important with, that we have the human dimension to in uh, increasingly interrogate those algorithms, to not allow them to remain status quo, uh, so that we are shaping them in ways that are ethically sound. When we talk about the human dimension, what does that actually mean? Because you've got coders, you've got programmers, you've got those involved in hardware, who are driving one key aspect of AI and the systems themselves. How does the, the, the human interface actually work in ensuring that the data that one collects or the machines collect uh, are data which is, which is appropriate and reflects what we're talking about here? Sure. I mean, one thing that, you know, for uh, having spent a couple of decades in and around global technology, one thing you take away is that these are collections of human beings in human organizations making choices. Right? And, and so on some level, to me, it, that's an empowering truth. It should give us all agency to feel that, wait a minute, we can use these abs abstract notions of algorithm and product and this, that, and the other, but these are ultimately people making choices. And so the more we can play a role, as we're doing today, in shaping a public conversation to fuel a landscape that we, that we seek, uh, we have that power in us. And, and you're right to flag that data is a big part of this, right? A lot of, uh, a lot of the conversation in the industry now and, and in the technology landscape for a long time has been how do we ensure the internet is reflective of, of the rest of the world? And I think, that, I think that that's a North Star now for the industry is to make sure data itself is, is um, inclusive. You know, when we look at um, OpenAI or ChatGPT or any other sort of chatbot or any other software which uses machine learning, uh, which uses AI, uh, we often ask questions and we expect one answer. Um, however, there may not necessarily be one answer if one looks at the humanities, if one looks at philosophical beliefs, if one looks at legal beliefs, if one looks at sociological uh, philosophies. It, it reflects the views of different people, different philosophies around the world. Therefore. Um, isn't that a real concern? We, ne we may never end up getting one answer. Humanities doesn't necessarily provide us with one answer. Yes, and I think those of us who study the humanities um, are very comfortable with that uncertainty. Yes. Um, and that's what drives the humanities, is the search for new perspectives, uh, interrogating the status quo, not being uh, comfortable with where we are at the moment. Uh, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, having singular answers in a set of data is not the same thing as telling a story or learning what our stories are and how they defined us as a, cult as a culture. And, and yet when one accesses that technology uh, for uh, the average user, you are seeking an answer. Uh, there's always the danger of too much information, uh, information overload in a sense. Um, so how does one address that? I mean, I think you address it with kind of ensuring that this landscape, this current tech landscape, all that came before, all that are to come, are surround sounded by a, a kind of fluency in the technology, but also an awareness of its limitations. Mm -hmm. I think it's incumbent on all of us in culture, no matter whether we're in the education sector or the policy sector or the technology sector, to understand that the atmospherics in which these products are launch, launched are just important as the products themselves. 
And so to the extent that we, I think we've all learned, for instance, in the last 10 years, you know, I was at Twitter for a long time, left Twitter just before sort of the big debates about misinformation and disinformation surfaced. And I think we're all a bit more sensitized and socialized, right, to, to being a bit more skeptical with information we come across in the digital medium. So I think just being a resiliency in the culture to understanding, well, if we're asking questions, it's important for us to also cultivate these skills of ambiguity. Um, that's a more macro societal project, if you will. Rishi, how do algorithms work? <laughs> Well, you know, what's interesting about kind of the conversation about generative AI, right, versus kind of prior forms of machine learning is, yes, you're, yes you deliver, you're, you're receiving an answer, um, but it's actually crafting a new answer each time. So there's this juxtaposition where all generative AI products are actually not just, not just spitting you the same thing each time. Each time you're getting actually a slightly different, differently tuned answer. Uh, but I'm not the expert. I'm not going to give a speech here about how algorithms work. Uh, but I will tell you that these are humans making choices, and that should give us all agency to participate and shape, shape these companies. Professor Newman, how uh, would you look at this statement, AI is intelligent? Would you associate the word intelligence with the machine? Uh, sure. I mean, I think that's, that's certainly possible. I think the question then becomes, so what do we do with that intelligence? How multifaceted is, is that intelligence? How adept is it at uh, capturing and interrogating complexity? Uh, we humans can do that. Uh, machines sometimes can be programmed to do that, but machines are represented by digital code. In the humanities, we're dealing with metaphor. We're dealing with revelation. We're dealing with epiphany. Those are more mysterious codes they're not as easy to define. And that's the challenge of the humanities and also what captures our interest in them. Cultural concepts change, Professor Newman. Um, what, was con what may have been considered uh, unacceptable by various societies in the past may be very acceptable now. Uh, and yet even there, there are differences between one country and the other, one legal system and the other. And therefore my question is this, um, there cannot perhaps be one system which reflects the reality of this world which is very diverse. Um, so do we therefore need to have different models of AI for different cultures and what is acceptable in one country and not as opposed to what may not be acceptable in another? How does one deal with the fact that we, we live in such a diverse world? Well, I, I, I think diversity is at the heart of the human experience and it's very important that we, do, we embrace that diversity, we be sensitive to that diversity, we try to encompass that diversity. Diversity also infuses systems and human cultures with the possibility for evolution. Uh, the absence of diversity gives you a static system, whether in the plant world, the animal world, or the human world. Uh, so the diversity is, is, is often quite complex, it sometimes complicates things, but again, the humanities are, have two major methodologies. One is to interrogate. The other is to bridge disparate things, things that we would never think about putting together previously. And that's the creativity behind them. Rishi, what is fake news to one person may be real news to another person. Uh, not just in, in, in terms of, of disinformation campaigns online, but even if you look at, for example, the situation in West Asia now, it really depends from which prism you're looking at the conflict between Israel and Iran or uh, Israel and Hamas, etc., etc. Uh, how does AI go through the information which is available in presenting a cogent answer? Well, I think, you know, AI, you know, all these companies are investing in tools that allow you to be able to understand what we call content provenance, the, you know, the, an, an understanding of the origination or originator of this content. But ultimately, these issues will amount to human beings ourselves developing the capacity and fluency and literacy around information and this new landscape we live in, uh, media literacy and fluency. And I think that's where the humanities come in. I think huma the humanities teach us to be question askers, to not to not merely consume, but to lean in. You know, a lot of people ask me, Vishnu, what are the humanities? What are we even talking about here? And, and so I wrote last year 
a six-word poem to describe the humanities to people, and, it's called, and it goes, awe and wonder in the other. The humanities are education and experiences that cultivate a sense of deep wonder and curiosity in human and other others. And when you, when you have that habit, when you have that culture around you, um, pushed by higher education, K-12 education, and, and our culture generally, I think you have a society that can puzzle piece into any complicated information ecosystem. And, and I think we're seeing that uh, these days by virtue of conversations like these. How worried are you, uh, Professor Newman, about um, disinformation online and through AI? We face a huge problem, for example, of deep fakes in India and indeed around the world. That's just one example. I'm, I'm very worried about it. And I would, uh, again, pick up on Rishi's comment about literacy. I think one of the fundamental things that we need to be teaching in classrooms these days in terms of literacy is digital literacy. We have enormous amounts of information available to us. Uh, more so than at any time in our history. Yet, to be able to select that information and assess the validity and credibility of that information is more and more challenging. And it's something that needs to be inculcated into the very uh, education system. Otherwise, it's like having an, an enormous hard drive with no processor whatsoever. Rishi, you know, the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities said, and uh, it's, uh, I was going through their website, in fact, this is in their preamble, that people are, uh, that there must be an assurance that people are, quote, masters of their technology and not its unthinking servants. Is that the real worry? That in as much as we have this conversation uh, and, and we choose to question how AI systems work and believe that it, it must reflect diverse views and opinions and theories, that most people will just accept what, what the system generates and that they become servants in a, in a sense to the technology. Well, what you what you've flagged, Vishnu, is, is a reminder that these questions, these conversations, the, these debates have been going on for, for centuries and decades since time immemorial. You know, I've read essays about the advent of motion pictures 100 years ago and people wondering what that means for our relationship with art. It's important to note that the National Endowment for the Humanities was created in the United States at the height of the Cold War. The Cold War was a period where a lot of these conversations were happening as well, sort of the atomization of life, the mechanization of life, the rise of the military industrial complex. And it's yet during that window that Presidents Kennedy and Johnson in the United States said, yes, we should contemplate technology policy, right? We tend to run towards technology policy, but let's co-equally invest in human, in humans. And so I think that's, that's been a theme of our visit here on behalf of the National Humanities Center. And I think it's, it's, it's a, um, I'm glad you cited the National Endowment there. Weaponizing artificial intelligence, it's already happening in so many parts of the world. Um, uh, do you see that as a serious threat to humanity? I think it certainly can be. Uh, again, it's the reason that we need to have the humanities in conversation consistently with technology. We need to bring the ethics, we need to bring the question of why, not just how, into the equation. Professor Newman, um, this is to sort of uh, bring this conversation to a little bit more of a sharp focus. The technology is evolving so fast that there are those who have been working with the technology who have been saying that AI systems are moving towards a form of sentience. Do you A, agree with that? And if that, is, if that is the case, then the entire debate on ethics needs to, to sort of examine that as well. Well, I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen in terms of scholarship in the humanities in our fellowship program are multiple explorations of what used to be considered the boundaries between the human and the non-human. Uh, whether it's, whether it's the, uh, the study of emotions and compassion and socializing in animals, or what constitutes the human-machine divide and how those boundaries are becoming more and more permeable. So I think the issues of uh, sentience... You accept that, that it's becoming more permeable? Oh, I do. I do. Uh, so I think the question of consciousness and sentience uh, is a very important avenue to continue to explore. I think the danger, of course, is removing the human entirely uh, from that equation. 
how would you look at this debate on uh, machines and sentience? I mean, I would say that <clears throat> I, would, I would concur with this notion of humans, humans in the loop. You know, I think that, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll go back to sort of these, these questions have been asked before, actually. And, you know, there was a study done in the United States in, uh, just after the Industrial Revolution where they were predicting out 100 years from, from then, i.e. now, what jobs, all the jobs will be gone, all the jobs will be changed. And it turns out all of the most, all the most popular jobs 100 years ago are still the most popular jobs today with the exception of software programmer in the list now as well. You know, you have your drivers, you have your, you have your lawyers, your accountants, your et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we'll see what happens here, but I'd encourage us, all of us to reflect back and be, be mindful of human resilience in the face of, in the face of these, these changes of this, these magnitudes. As the technology evolves, we've seen programmers associated with Google, with Microsoft, etc., etc., working with AI systems, being, um, in a sense, worried about um, the responses they're getting from machines, which, uh, which appear to be possibly emotionally driven. Now, that's debatable. That's, that's the debate. Um, do you believe that there is enough on record to indicate that... Uh, Again, sentience is becoming a reality for some systems. Is the technology there? Yeah, I think, I think look, that's debatable, and, I, and I'll, I'll defer to scholars who study. You know, one of my, one scholar I've talked to is, uh, reflects on, do, can robots and machines feel pain? Yes. And what he's explored is pain itself is a subjective phenomenon, right? Pain, when someone reports pain, it's, it's an entirely subjective reflection, actually. There's no objective way to gauge pain. And so, with that in mind, one can make the case that indeed robots can feel pain. So in some sense, I'll let the scholars debate and analyze that. Uh, but what I will say again is, coming back to this point, that um, there are people making choices in these rooms, and that should all give us all a feeling that we can be there too, and we can, we can articulate a viewpoint from the outside or the inside. Would you like to add to, to anything on, on sentience and the conversation there? I think, again, what, what is interesting about the human dimension is the question of narrative and the question of storytelling. I don't think as, uh, at this point in time we have machines capable of doing uh, massive creativity in terms of storytelling, in terms of stories that essentially capture our culture, that reach deep into our emotions, and that essentially inspire us toward social harmony and community. Um, that doesn't currently exist. That's a human dimension. Yeah. Rishi, unequal access to AI tech. Uh, at, some, at some stage, I mean, most, most companies offering AI tech now, at some level, want to make money off it. Um, and therefore, there is this real concern that some may have access to it, which is often beneficial, while others won't. Is that problematic? I think most AI companies you'll see, you know, uh, have the word safety as sort of word number five in their mission statement. The other thing to be mindful of is these systems are being built in 2024, not 2014, not 04. We, we are in an incredibly different civil society environment than we were 10 years ago. You know, when I was leading the charge for, for Twitter in many parts of the world and 10 years before that at Google, these conversations occurred after the fact. Right? These kinds of interviews and exchanges and a culture that, that asks questions at the front end uh, didn't happen. Right? So I think, we live in an, an, I think we live in a more learned culture around technology where we're asking these questions at the front end and you have companies accepting questions and grateful for them and running towards policymakers, which I think is a, is a good sign. Professor Newman, job losses in AI. Uh, how do you look at uh, the potential of extensive job losses? Uh, I think it's always a, a danger. I think I, I worry a bit about the exclusive focus, uh, the very narrow focus, and the very immediate focus um, on economic usefulness in terms of interpreting the humanities and in terms of interpreting AI. Uh, I think we need a much more longer vision of things uh, and a much more sort of multifaceted vision of things as well. As you know, the humanities have been under attack, at least in the United States, but I think globally as well, as not being an incubator for uh, economic viability. That is simply not the case. 
Um, I can tell you that in the United States, that the salaries of mid-career people who have majored in the humanities are roughly equivalent to the salaries of mid-career people who have majored in the sciences. So uh, I think it's very, very limiting to worry only about some kind of immediate, narrow focus uh, and usefulness only being defined in an economic sense. Who gets to regulate AI? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think it's we the people. Ultimately, right? I mean, I think that as opposed to we the government, because governments have problems with AI. <laughs> well, we the people, our governments are reflective of the people. I mean, I think it's I think it's a we the people scenario here. And you know, reflecting a little bit back on what Dr. Newman was just uh, talking about, I look ahead to the year 2050, and I think about in the year 2050, you're sitting in a meeting room, and someone says something breakthrough, product meeting, a go-to-market meeting, a sales meeting. What will it be about that individual's comment that stands out? Will it be that they had out-programmed everybody in the room? Will it be that they had out-mathematically modeled something in the room? I doubt it. I think it will be that what they shared came from a deeply human place. And, and I, think it's, I, think, I think a North Star in that regard is a little bit of what we're reflecting on here around the importance of the humanities. Yeah. A final question. Program or be programmed? Uh, is it important for, for people like us in the humanities uh, you know, to, to learn some code, to get into programming and to be part of uh, the process where we actually extract the information that we seek? I think it's very or we can keep talking about theory all day. Well, I think, I think theory is, Sigmund Freud said, theory is important but does it, it doesn't keep things from happening. Uh, and I think that's a very uh, uh, insightful comment. I think it's very important in this day and age that students learn code. Uh, I think it's also extremely important that they have the humanities infiltrated uh, into their uh, studies, into the curriculum completely. One without the other is not, does not make, is not conducive to a democratic system or a fulfilling life. You want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Education needs to incorporate, imbibe AI, not just the AI systems, but um, this sort of conversation on where we are going with it. 100% Vishnu. I would say, you know, of course we all should be fluent in these tools and technology. I would, I would, I would offer though that we live in a culture in which that happens more naturally. We live in a culture in many countries where, you know, teaching technical skills is in the main, right? I'm on YouTube all the time trying to teach myself everything I can about transformers and LLMs and, and the latest approach to coding and programming. But do we live in a culture where humanities education, self-education self is in the main? I don't think so. It's why at Virginia Tech last year, I started the world's first executive degree in the humanities, where senior leaders in the technology landscape are spending a year studying philosophy, religion, literature, creative writing, and more, because they sense that notwithstanding their technical and business skills, it's the skills that emanate from the humanities that will make or break a career. Fascinating conversation. I'd like to thank you both very much for being with us. As we begin to wrap up this part of um, this session, uh, I'm remind, reminded of Stanislav Petrov, who was a, a Soviet lieutenant during the Cold War, in charge of uh, a bank of machines which was getting um, information through radars and other sensors on a potential launch of intercontinental ballistic missiles from the United States. And uh, this was one person who got the information that the US had launched against the USSR. And he chose to ignore the information in front of him uh, saying that, no, it's glitched. Had that system been automated, then perhaps we wouldn't have been having this conversation today. So the point being, a person in the loop is critical at, at all levels when one looks at AI and where we are headed. Thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you.